Okay. Mark chapter 10, and we'll look at verse uh, 35. Before we read the scripture, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been compelled to do something that seemed so right, but it was wrong? Have you ever been compelled to do something that seemed so right, but it was wrong? I remember one winter, I was driving one early Sunday morning, trying to get to church early, and I, I hadn't watched the news the night before. And I took off like I normally do, but this morning there was black ice everywhere. And once I got that van up to about 30 or 35 miles per hour, all of a sudden the van just started to slide. Do you know what my first reaction was to do? Would that be right or a wrong thing to do? Wrong. We know that in this situation, what your natural instinct to do is the wrong thing to do. How do we know that? Because we've been taught, right? I don't cook that often, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> because I didn't know, my philosophy in cooking is the more seasoning you put on, the better it tastes. But I've learned, even though I don't cook a lot, if there's a grease fire, my first thought would be to throw water on it. But would that be the right or the wrong thing to do? Let me, let me say something this morning. With us having a sinful nature, us being human, most of the things that we would naturally do in God's eyes is mostly wrong. We all have the predilection for fleshly things. We are drawn to the ways of the world because we live in this world. If it wasn't for Jesus, I and yourself would be known for our infamy our bad deeds. Christians should be those who are flexible and open towards change. The Bible is designed to confront wrong thinking. When it comes to living this Christian life, we must learn to do the opposite of what we normally would do. Here in Mark chapter 10, Verses 35, the Bible says, James and John, the son of Zebedee, they come unto him and they said, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, what would ye that I should do for you? And they said unto him, grant unto us that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left in thy glory. What do you want from God? Because here we see two men, two godly men, making a request to God. And my question to you this morning is what do you want from God? The Bible is designed to correct our thinking. And as I'm going to show you through this text, their wants were wrong. Their want was fleshly, selfish. And if we're not careful in the Christian life, a lot of things that we want are the wrong things. So I want you to think of that question this morning. What is it that you want from God? What is it that you pray for? What are you praying for? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you and we thank you for this day. And thank you for your word. May you and you alone be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
James and John in verse 35, they came to Jesus asking for the wrong thing. They came up saying, we want you to do what we ask. We want you to do what we want. How many times do we pray for the wrong thing? What James and John were saying to Jesus, they said, we demand this. We want you to do this for us. And their desire from God was a selfish desire. How many things we want from God are selfish? How many of the things that we want from God are spiritual? And you need to think about that this morning. To evaluate your prayer life. What do you pray for? Now, I have to say this because I love to say this a lot. You have to have a balance in the Christian life. There is absolutely nothing wrong with having some earthly goals or having earthly things. But there is something wrong if that's all we think about. James and John didn't desire something spiritual. So my question to you this morning is, the things you're praying to God about, are they spiritual or fleshly? The destination here in our text was Jerusalem. In, John, in Mark chapter 10 and verse 32, it says, and they were in the way going where? To Jerusalem. And Jesus being their leader, it says, and Jesus went where? Before them. A leader always lead. And as he went before them, they were amazed and they followed and they were afraid. Look at the mindset of these men that were following Jesus. The Bible says that they were amazed and they were afraid. In verses 33 and 34, Jesus explains to his disciples that he's going to be betrayed. In verse 33, Jesus says, behold, we go up to Jerusalem and the son of man shall be delivered unto the chief priest. And unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to, unto death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. And they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him. And Jesus said, they will kill me. But he said, don't worry about that. He said, on the third day, guess what? God's going to raise me back up. And here it is that Jesus shares the gospel with the disciples. This is the gospel. Jesus' death and his burial and his resurrection. I want you to pay attention to this, though. Here Jesus is sharing the gospel with them, and they didn't get it. They didn't get it. Here we are in Mark chapter 10, but if you go back to Mark chapter 8, you'll see Jesus was explaining to them the gospel in Mark chapter 8. Look at verse 31. And here they are in Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi. Um, we see that in verse 27. It says, and Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of what? Okay, and then in verse 31, the Bible says he began to do what? Teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days, here he is explaining to them the gospel. And the Bible says in verse 32, as he spoke to them, Peter opened his mouth and said, we're not going to let this happen. He rebuked Jesus. In verse 33, Jesus, being the patient teacher that he is, he, 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 he looked at Peter and he rebuked. And he said, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Here Peter was thinking wrongly. They didn't get it. When you get to Mark chapter 9 and you look at verse 30, as the, as the destination is Jerusalem. And here in Mark chapter 9 and verse 30, it says they departed thence and passed through where? Galilee. So now they're going to Galilee, and what did Jesus do in verse 31? He took time to teach them about the gospel again. 
For he taught the disciples again, saying, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. Verse 32 says something about them. What does verse 32 say about the disciples? They didn't get it. Now what does that teach you and I? Here it is, these men are following Jesus, they close followers of Jesus, Jesus is explaining to them, he's going to die and he's going to be buried and he's going to be re-raised on the third day and the Bible continue, continually show us they didn't get it. So what does that teach you and I? We can't get frustrated with people when they don't understand the gospel message the first and the second and the third time that we're trying to share the gospel with people. And how often do we get frustrated when we share the gospel with people and they don't get it the first time? We have to learn to give people time to believe. We have to learn to give people time to hear. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. Now here in Mark, Chapter 10, the Bible says that James and John were the son of Zebedee. Zebedee means the gift of God or gift of Jehovah. John means Jehovah is gracious or Yahweh is gracious. John is referred to as the one whom Jesus loved. John was a fisherman like Peter and Andrew. John, along with James, was included in Jesus' inner circle. Now, many times throughout the scripture, we see Peter, James, and John, their names are all mentioned together. Now, there are at least four James in the New Testament. James, the son of Alphaeus, he was one of the disciples. James, the one who was known as the Lord brother. And then, y'all do know that Jesus had brothers and sisters, right? So, James was known as the Lord brother. Jesus had half-brothers and half-sisters. They had the same mother, but different daddies. Who was Jesus' siblings' daddy? Joseph. Who was Jesus' daddy? That's important. They had different daddies, but they had the same mother. The last James was the father of Judas, not Iscariot, the other Judas. This I want you to Pay attention to this. This is important. James and John were close followers of Jesus, but they never got to the point that they didn't need to be taught. Think about that for a second. James and John were close followers of Jesus, but they never got to the point that they didn't need to be taught. What does that say for you and I? Well, Y'all awfully quiet this morning. What does that say for you and I? Don't ever get to the point that you think you, you can't be taught anything. Go to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. And look at verse 49. The Bible says, And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name. Here John, a close follower of Jesus, and listen to what he said. He said, Master, we saw somebody uh, not following. Well, he said, let me go back. 49, he said, John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name. And we forbade him because he followers not with us. That was his thought process. Because they're not following us, what they're doing must be wrong. Jesus said unto him, forbid him not. For he that is not against us is for us. Now, if you sit and think about that, we in the church still need to be taught. Because we have a tendency of thinking that if a person's not a Baptist, 
they're not a child of God. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're not God's children because they're not a Baptist. We have a tendency of thinking because people don't do things the way we do them. They don't follow exactly the way we would do it. And Jesus said, if, 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 if they're not against us, then they for us. We in the church need to learn how to judge people based upon their message about the Lord Jesus Christ and what they believe about Jesus Christ and not so much about our preferences. People are not always going to do things the way we would do them. But if they are our brothers and sisters in Christ, guess what? We are to love them and encourage them to keep serving God. Stay there in Luke chapter 9 and look at verse 51. In verse 51 it says, And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go where? Remember, Jerusalem was the destiny. He said, and, and he sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of Samaria to make ready for him. And they did not receive Jesus because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, who, what disciples? James and John. When they saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elijah did? What did Jesus do? He told him, you're thinking wrongly. Your thoughts ain't right. Jesus said, ye know not what manner of spirit ye are, for the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Now, I like what James and John did in verse 54. Y'all see what James and John did in verse 54? Did y'all see it? Before they tried to call down fire from heaven, what did they do? What did they do? Okay. So for us, if we're honest, too often we do things first. And then we go to the Lord in prayer. Too often we make decisions to do something. And then we go talk to the Lord about it. But what I like about them is before they made this decision, they went and talked to the Lord about it. We need to learn how to go to God first and say, Lord, what will you have me to do? Is this right or is this wrong? And go back to Mark chapter 10 and verse 35. They called Jesus master. Referring to him as master, they were saying teacher. And if you go through the New Testament, all throughout the New Testament, you'll see that Jesus took opportunities to teach. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23, Jesus was teaching. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 2, we see Jesus teaching. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 28 and 29, we see Jesus teaching. Jesus is still teaching today. He's still teaching today. It's a matter of, are you and I listening? But Jesus is still teaching today. In Mark 10 and verse 36, Jesus asked them a question. He said, what were ye that I should do for you? I love Jesus. He is, he is so patient with them. Even though he knew what they were insinuating, he said, let me go ahead and, and, and take time and teach them. So Jesus said, what is it that you want from me? Don't we need to be more like Jesus when it comes to being patient with people? 
I know I do. I struggle sometimes. I, I, I mean, I do. I struggle. You've been in church for 10, 15 years. I'm like, you don't get it. But then I have to remember, man, Sean, there's time you didn't get it. Right? And I know y'all want to look at me like I'm the only one that's impatient with people, but you struggle too. Can I, this is, you know how, I really pay attention when Pastor Scott's teaching, and there's one thing he has said in the seven years I've been here that really bothers him. You correct me if I'm wrong, Pastor. He doesn't like if somebody does something to a child. That really, <sighs> y'all done heard him say it? That just rubs him the wrong way. Can I get y'all what rubs me the wrong way? <laughs> this rubs me. I mean, it rubs me. It, how, how that, this rubs me. When people seek positions of power in the church, it rubs me. It rubs me because the simple fact, it is all about Christ. Everything that we do is for the glory of God. When people are, are, are fighting about positions and prestige and power in the church, it rubs me. Because I'm like, you don't get it. It's not about us. And here it is, these disciples, they were fighting for position. <laughs> they themselves were thinking about themselves. Our thoughts are just like theirs, thoughts at times, contrary to the way God would have us to think. And the reason for that is because the world teaches us to think about you. Self first. If you don't think about yourself, who else is? The world teaches us. This one preacher told a story of a lady who went to her pastor and she said, Pastor, I need some counseling. She said, I think I may be sinning. She said, please help me. So the pastor looked at her. He said, OK, what's the problem? She said, well, I come to church every Sunday and I can't help thinking that I am the prettiest woman in the church. <laughs> she said, I look at all these other ladies and, and they can't even hold a candle to me. She said, what should I do, Pastor, about these thoughts? So the pastor lovingly said, honey, that's not a sin, that's a mistake. <laughs> he, said, he said, just remember what you look like when you wake up in the morning. In the economy of God, selfishness and pride takes us nowhere. The Bible says before honor is humility. In this life, the rich has an advantage over the poor, but in, in, in the economy of God, in God's eyes, the rich has no advantage over the poor. God is the God of, of the rich and the poor. If we're not careful, before salvation, our thought process was all about getting those Benjamins. Huh? If you don't know what Benjamins are, that's a shame on you. <laughs> but that's what I was thinking about, getting them Benjamins. And we love, in my generation, we love rap music. I remember this one rap song came out and said, I got my mind on my money and my money on my mind. I used to be like, yeah. <laughs> I got my mind on my money and my money on my mind. I'll be feeling it, riding. <laughs> Valerie, you said you didn't know I could move like that. But how many of you know the Christian life is against everything we've been taught before Christ? And it's sad to say that when we come to church and we give our life to Christ, we want to keep the same mindset we had when we was in the world. In Mark chapter 10 and verse 37, 
They said unto him, they said, Jesus, we want you to grant us, grant us to be able to sit one on that right hand and one on the other, your left hand in glory. We, we want to be where you are. We, we, we want a position of prestige. And Jesus told them, you don't understand what you're asking for. The cup Jesus was referring to was the cup of suffering. Jesus said, you have no idea about the cup that I'm going to drink. You remember when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane and he prayed, he said, Father, this cup. And he was speaking of how he had to suffer. Jesus prayed to God the Father about the cup he was going to drink. And these disciples are asking, they said, Jesus tells them in verse 38 of Mark chapter 10, Jesus said unto them, ye know not what ye ask. He said, can ye drink of the cup that I drink of? And be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, yes, we can. And Jesus said, you, you shall indeed drink. You will. You'll get a t taste of it. Now, when you sit and think about it, what Jesus was telling them, you will join me in suffering. Sad to say, most Christians don't understand that suffering is a part of the Christian life. Whenever we suffer, we want to ask God, Lord, deliver me from this. But actually, we should be praying, Lord, teach me what it is you would have me to learn from this. Timothy says that all those who live godly will suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12. John 15, 18, I believe Jesus said, if they hated me, guess what? They're going to hate you. Suffering is a part of the Christian life. James did suffer. He was the first disciple to be martyred in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. John experienced great persecution. You know that he was exiled to the island of Pathmoth. Jesus, in verse 40 of Mark chapter 10, shows his submission to the Father, because this is what Jesus said. He said, look, but to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. Look at what happened in verse 41. The Bible says, and when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with who? James and John. Now, remember, these are the close followers of Jesus. Some of the disciples had the same name. There were two Simons, Simon Peter and Simon Azalea. There was two disciples named James, James and James of Alphaeus. There were two named Judas, Judas of James and Judas Iscariot. Many had more than one name. It's possible that Bartholomew was Nathaniel. We know that Matthew was known as Levi. Thomas was known as Thaddeus. Judas of James was called Thaddeus. Thomas was known as Didymus or Doubting Thomas. You go through looking at the disciples, you see they had many things in common, but I had to bring this point out. One thing that they had in common is that they were made out of the same material. They all had a sin nature. And because of what we see in verse 42, we know that they all struggle with selfishness because in 42, the Bible says that Jesus called them to him. He called them all to him. Now, I love verse 42 through 45 because here is the climax of our text. Verse 42, Jesus called them unto him and he said, ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles, exercise lordship over them. And their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. Who, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even a son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. This is the climax of the text. Jesus 
the reigning king becomes the suffering servant who willingly lays down his life to rescue sinful men. The word ransom can be found in 1 Timothy as well. Go to 1 Timothy and see how Paul explains this to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse 1. First Timothy chapter two and look at verse one. The Bible says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplication, prayers, intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. This is so important that we get what verse four says. What is God's desire? How many men? We need to say that together. In, in, in God's, God's eyes, in God's desire, it is his desire that how many people get saved? All. Oh. Okay. He wants them to come into the knowledge of the truth. Verse 5 says, for there is one God, one mediator between God and men, and that mediator is the man, Christ Jesus. And here's the word, verse 6. What did Christ Jesus do? Hmm. Ransom is the payment that Jesus Christ paid with his life in exchange for freedom for us because of our sin. And he set us free from all of the consequences and the penalty of sin. Aren't you grateful for that? Aren't you grateful that you don't have to pay for your sins? Before Christ, you and I were in bondage to sin. We couldn't stop. Y'all remember those days? I do. I love to look back in the rear view and think about where I was before and, and now look at the person that I am today. I love to look at, you know, how the, the, the devil tries to trip you up sometimes with some stuff and you can look back and say, you know what, back in the day I would get caught up with that, but today, by the grace of God, I have a little bit of sense or discernment, I should say, that I'm not going to go for that. Isn't it a blessing to be able to look back at how far you have come? Who gets the credit for that? The Lord Jesus. It wasn't just Jesus' death that saved us. It was his death, his burial, and the resurrection. Because Paul explains it to us in Corinthians, if Jesus has not risen from the grave, we would still be in our sins. It was not just his death alone, it's the resurrection. And that is why Paul said he wants his desire in Philippians, he said, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. There's power in understanding how Christ was, was raised from the dead. And when you understand that concept that the same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead lives inside of you, you understand how much power you have to live this Christian life. I love 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. It says, for therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God. Our God is not like those dead idols. We serve a living God. But look at what he says. God is the what? but especially of those who what? Salvation is available for everyone. Whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the message that the world so desperately needs to hear today, the gospel. Jesus here in Mark is trying to get the disciples to understand this isn't about you. You guys are seeking positions of power. This isn't about you. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and is a discerner of the what? Thoughts and intent of the heart. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 5 talks about our weapons are not fleshly, but they 
They're, they're mighty and pulling down strongholds. And we ought to be bringing every thought into the obedience of Christ. Every thought, not some, every thought. The word of God confronted Jonah when he was angry. You remember? The word of God came and confronted Cain when he offered the wrong sacrifice. The word of God came and confronted David when he had sinned. The word of God all throughout the scriptures confronts man about his sins. The word of God confronts our wrong thinking. The word of God will not just change our thoughts or confront our thoughts, but it will change our lives. We are prone to think wrongly. TV shows, social media, music, the flesh, all of that affects how we think. We need to avoid underestimating the importance of the role that the word of God has in our life. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. We need God's word to help us think right. If you, you know, this one preacher said, I don't know where he got it from, but this is what he said. The Bible will keep you from sin. Or sin will keep you from the Bible. I don't care what you say. But evaluate your devotion time. Nobody's asking you to confess anything this morning. This is between you and God. You think about last week, how much time did you spend reading your Bible? You think about it. You think about last week. Watch this. And I don't want y'all, I'm not, I'm not throwing any rocks at anybody this morning, but I need y'all to understand. Wednesday night Bible study is not full like this. You know why? We don't have music on Wednesday night. We don't have the, Wednesday night is strictly for what? Bible study. I want to encourage you. If you're not working, you got time, guess what you need to do? Get here. Get here. Every time you have an opportunity to hear the word of God being taught or preached, guess what you should be doing? Amen. Trying to get it. Every time you have an opportunity to open this book yourself, guess what you need to do? Get it. None of us eat once or twice a week. Now, don't play with me. We eat all through the week. <laughs> right? Amen. And if you like me, I eat three times a day. And then snacks in between. <laughs> okay, y'all laughing, but I'm, I'm going to keep it real with you. I try to use the same habit in my spiritual life. I'm trying by the grace of God to eat all day. You know why? Because my thinking's not right. I'm not lying. I'm not going to sit here and try to act like it is. My, my thought process is all messed up. You do something to my wife and my kids, I, I'm at you. But if I read my Bible, my thought process to be different. You say the wrong thing to me, my thought process is to say something back to you. But if I'm in my word, it won't come that way. What I'm trying to tell you is that your thought process is not right if you're not in this word. And that's why we have a lot of foolishness going on in the church. It's not just, just because of people, it's because we're not in the word like we should be. And it, it, it's not right that the church right now, we're quiet. I mean, we're quiet. And this LGBT movement, they loud. I mean, they demanding their rights. They're demanding their rights, and we, we Christians. The world we live in today need to hear the word of God to correct their wrong thinking. I don't care what nobody say, it's never going to be right for a man to be with a man. Never. Never going to be right. And the world needs, and Sister Banks said, or oh, a woman to be with a woman. We hope they got that, ma'am. We as a church have to keep pointing people to the word of God. Now, can I say this as kindly as I can? You know why we in the church are not pointing people to the word of God? 
because we don't want to be confronted with it ourselves. The moment you start opening up the word trying to show somebody they're wrong, guess what they're going to say? Well, your attitude just nasty. <laughs> I know that's not what the Bible teach. It does matter what people think about Jesus. It matters. Have you ever thought about doing something that seems so right, but it actually was wrong? Remember this, even close followers of Jesus struggle with wrong thoughts, selfish thoughts. I would dare to say that we follow Jesus for all the wrong reasons. Jesus is not some good luck charm. You got to understand everything under the sun is vanity. It's not going to last. Sister Lee, I love you. Brother Lee, love you. We're going to miss you. I thank you for your testimony. Y'all, some of y'all might have missed it, but they've already, they sold it. I heard her testimony. She sold her house in four days here. Well, praise God. And now they got another house. They already got their house over there. Well, praise God. But you heard what she said. She said, a house is a house. She said, y'all pray for me that I will continue to open my mouth and be a witness. That's where we want to be. God has blessed them to be able to enjoy life. But look, it's more to, more to life than just having a house. It's more to life than just taking trips. Nothing wrong with those things, but we got to have a balance. We need to evaluate our thoughts. We need to evaluate our wants. Are your wants fleshly or spiritual? I'm asking you this morning, what do you want from God? What do you want? James and John, they were thinking fleshly. They were thinking selfishly. And our great Savior said, Jesus said, let me teach you to think correctly. Let me help you think right. Jesus is saying the same thing to us today. Let me help you think right. Isaiah tells us this. God's ways are not like our ways. His thoughts are not like our thoughts. And it's not that we cannot ever understand God's ways. It's just it's going to take some time. Y'all re remember what happened? I'm not going to get too deep into that, but a few weeks ago, a young man made national news because he forgave someone for murdering his brother. This young man took an opportunity to tell his brother's murderer that he loved them. And he said, I forgive you. But he also took time and said, you need to give your life to Jesus. Now, on social media, they was going crazy about that. Like, what in the world? Who would do that? Do you know forgiveness? It's the opposite of what we're taught in the world. We don't forgive people. They do something to us or our family, we get them, right? But what did God tell us to do? Love your enemies. Forgive people. For us to think correctly and to live this Christian life the way God would have us to live it, we got to stay in this word. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to encourage you this morning. Stay in the word. Spend time in this book. And whenever the church doors are open, try to get here. This world is not your friend. The devil is a liar. And for you young people, I'm, I, I'm emotional right now about it, for you young people, because you guys are in trouble. You guys are in trouble. I'm looking at the church and we're losing young people. You guys are in trouble. And I got to say this this morning. I got to say this. The mother in Matthew, it tells us that the mother wanted the same thing for the kids. We as parents have to be careful what we desire for our kids. Most of what we want for our kids is selfish and fleshly. And I'm going to say this, not just this church, but many in America have benefited from having a godly man and a godly woman in their life. 
I've had the privilege to sit under three pastors, my pastor in Michigan, both pastors in Michigan and Pastor Scott. I appreciate everything I've learned from all three of those godly men. My first pastor, he was so focused on soul winning. Love that. My second pastor, he was just real. He was a little crazy. I love that. He kept, he was himself. <laughs> pastor Scott, focused on teaching. The combination of the three things I've learned from those godly men are priceless. What I'm saying to you is that why wouldn't you want your kid to grow up, your young man, if you have a son, to be a godly man? Why wouldn't you want your son to pastor a church? Why wouldn't you want your son to be a missionary? But that's not what we pray for, for our children and our grandchildren. We want them to be successful in the world. Where would you be today without a man of God? Where would your life be without a man of God? You didn't come here this morning by accident. So why wouldn't we want that for our kids? But we don't want our kids to be in the ministry. We want better for them. Are you serious? I mean, I'm serious. I'm, I'm, I'm saying it right now because I know some of you have kids and some of you have grandkids. What are you praying for? God's work must keep going. How is it going to keep going without workers? We need, can I say something? I'm going to leave this and I'm done. I love my wife. I need her. I pastor the church for four years without her, and then I pastor the last two years with her. I'd rather have her by my side than not by my side. Do you, for those of you that had little girls, why wouldn't you be praying that they be a pastor's wife? Haven't y'all enjoyed the first lady? She's been sweet most of the time, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, my prayer, I'm being, I'm being real with y'all this morning. My prayer, it might not happen, but my prayer that is this God's will live will be a godly woman to some godly man, and they can serve God together. Most of the stuff we want are the wrong things. So all I'm trying to do is encourage you this morning. Think about what it is that you want. And if you know that what you want doesn't line up with what God will is for your life, change your thinking. Get into this word, amen? amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you, and we thank you for your word. Sometimes, Lord, your word challenges us to be better. Help us, Father God, not to just leave here and let your word fall on deaf ears. Lord, you have called us to be holy. You want us to be different. The church should be holy. Your word teaches us that you want us to be blameless so that you can use us to bring others to Christ. Lord, help us to understand why we're here. Open up our hearts and our minds to understand your purpose, your agenda. Help us to get away from selfishness and allow you to have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. If you're here this morning and you're not 100% sure that